Good evening and welcome to Friday Night Light. <laughs> I'm laughing because it's Thursday afternoon and I'm pre-recording this for you for Friday night. We'll post it before Friday night so you can watch it at your leisure. But I don't like to cancel anything. I like to keep on moving on. And uh, I'm here in Wilmington, North Carolina, visiting my daughter and my grandkids and my son-in-law and my son-in-law is pastor of Calvary Chapel, Wilmington, and he has allowed me to use their sanctuary to record this. You can see the sign behind me, Calvary Chapel, Wilmington, uh, love, word, worship, impact. That's, uh, that's what they say behind I, I like it. So at, at any rate, here we are, Friday Night Light. Last week, we started in the book of Romans, you'll remember, and we only went like seven verses. Uh, but um, Paul was writing this letter probably on his third missionary journey, you'll remember, uh, from Corinth. And his desire was to get to Rome, but he had to get to Jerusalem first. There was a threat on his life, so instead, instead of hopping on a ship from Corinth, he, uh, he walked around and then he caught another ship and ended up in Jerusalem. You know the story. We went through the book of Acts. But Paul's desire was to get to Rome, and you're going to hear him say that again tonight as he writes this letter to the Romans. At any rate, he was hoping to get there. Uh, he was being delayed. He was looking for an opening. He was looking for the will of the Lord, and the Lord would eventually say, you're going to Rome. But in the meantime, his heart was that he would send them this letter, which is a very foundational letter doctrines uh, that are very sound that the church needs and needs to hold on to. It's a wonderful, wonderful uh, letter to the Romans. It's 16 chapters long. It's going to take us a while to get through, especially at the rate that I go. But you'll remember last week he started right out, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle and separated to the gospel of of God. So he knows his calling. He is an apostle. He's also a bondservant of Jesus Christ. That's the first thing he mentions. And then he knows that he's, he understands that he's been separated out from his mother's womb for the purpose of sharing the gospel. Now, he didn't spend his whole life doing that, but eventually God got a hold of him, apprehended him, as it says in Philippians. And Paul has not let go of that calling, and he writes this letter. I'm not going to review every verse, but I will review to you that he says he called, we're called saints already. You don't have to become a saint. You don't have to do a bunch of cool stuff or good stuff to become a saint. Uh, no, you are, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you are a saint already. And I like that, so I'll just remind you of that. And then he calls us beloved, like, his, like God said to him, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, the same kind of wording. We are the beloved of the Lord. He loves us. And he, we ended last week talking about grace and peace. That's how Paul always greets in his letters, grace and peace. Grace comes first and then peace. And I hope that you've been living in that grace all week long and in that peace that comes with it. You can't have peace until you know the grace of God, unmerited favor. You are his son or his daughter today, and therefore you should live like that and, and understand that. But let's go on. In verse 8 and 9, it says, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. So those two verses right there, first, he says, first. The first thing I want to say to you is I thank my God, my God. He calls him my God. He is, that's very possessive. I thank my God every day through Jesus Christ for you all. That's who he's thanking the Lord for, at you. He thanks the Lord for you. The Romans, he is saying that. And he, what he says here is that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole 
world, that entire world where he had been in, in Greece and in modern day Turkey, all those churches, those missionary trips, he was hearing about the faith of the Roman church that was already there. This is not a church that he founded. Where he got started, we're not sure. But he knows and he says that their faith has been spoken of throughout the entire world. Maybe wherever he goes, he hears, did you hear about those Romans and the faith that they have, the, the trust and the belief that they have in, in Jesus and in the word of God? You know, so that's what he says to them. And then he goes on, verse 9, God is my witness. He calls God to the witness stand. God is my witness that what, 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 does, what has God witnessed? Well, that I serve him with my spirit and the gospel of his son, and that without ceasing, I make mention of you always in my prayer. So Paul has taken on the role of being an intercessor and praying. He prays for all the churches, every, every church that he has founded. You'll find it in almost all his letters that he's mentioning about prayer. You see it. Prayer is a must for Paul. I don't know why it is that the prayer meeting is the least popular meeting in the whole church. It always has been, but it is probably the most important and most foundational thing that you can have in your life and in the life of the church. The church cannot live and be alive without prayer, and Paul knows this. He says, without ceasing, I pray and I make mention of you in my prayers. He doesn't say exactly how he says it to God. Hey, Lord, bless those Romans. Please keep them, protect them. I know that we do that for our mission uh, overseas uh, in Finland, in Sweden. We pray for them and we pray for others. Uh, what kind of a pastor would I be if I didn't pray for the people in the church that, that come to the church that I pastor over? And so you see the heart of a true servant here is to pray. I make, in I make mention of you in my prayers, and God is my witness that I do that. Prayer is a must for Paul. He does it without ceasing, ceasing night and day. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 16 says, do not, he, do, he does not cease to give thanks for you. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> making mention of you in my prayers. That's the Ephesian church. 2 Timothy 1.3, who, he's speaking, he writes the letter to Timothy. I thank God whom I serve with a pure conscience as my forefathers did, as without ceasing I remember you in my prayers night and day. So individual, he picks out individuals, especially people that are going through tough times. He's praying for Timothy because Timothy is carrying on the pastor, being a pastor of the church in Ephesus. And he knows that he needs prayer. Pastors need prayer. So Paul tells Timothy that he does this. Prayer is very important. You know, uh, for you, you should also have that in your life. Just one verse on prayer, and I've got a lot. But Matthew 6, 6, Jesus says, But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. We have a, pray, a place to pray. It doesn't have to be a closet or anything like that. It, it can be, uh, but you have your place to play. You, you know, you can pray anywhere. You can go out on the path and pray. You can go out on the beach and pray. You can, you can, you can sit at the table and pray. You can pray anywhere and everywhere. But does your father see you? And if he does see you, he will reward you. That's what Jesus says. You know, I, I think about this, and as I said, I could talk about prayer all day long, but uh, you remember in the book of Acts, uh, I think it was, I'm not sure if it was an Ephesus or not, but there were seven sons of Sceva, and they were, 
they were uh, trying to cast out demons and the demons said to them, uh, Jesus I know, Paul I know, but who are you? You remember that? And they chased those guys. The demons chased those guys. They didn't know those guys. They were claiming the name of Jesus and they didn't know Jesus. But I guess my point is, is in prayer, do the demons know your name? Do they know your name? They know Jesus. They know Paul. Does, do they know my name? And so prayer needs to be important. He opens this letter to the Romans saying, I make mention of you all the time, and God is my witness. We'll go on verses 10 through 13. He goes on and says, Making a request if by some means... Now at last I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. There it is. Uh, he's making a request. God, I need to get to Rome. I really want to get to Rome. I got Rome in my heart. I really want to go. Is it your will that I can go? And he says, now at last I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. So he's writing this letter. I really want to come and see you. For I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift so that you may be established. My, my reason for coming to you is that I may be able to edify you and strengthen you, give to you some food to eat, some meat. Uh, he had that in his heart. Just He wants to be able to share the doctrines and then it goes on, verse 12, that is that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. So Paul says, man, uh, we might be encouraged together. We could fellowship together. You know, isn't that great when you find other people that are believers that you can sit down with and you can encourage and edify and build one another up? It's not tiring at all when we can sit down in church together, after church, sit to, and pray together, encourage one another with the Word of God, maybe even go out to lunch, have something, and it just builds all day long. We're encouraging. Paul has this in his heart. That I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. Now, I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often planned to come to you but was hindered until now, that I might have some fruit among you also, just as among the other Gentiles. So he's just saying, I don't want to be. I don't want you to be unaware. I've planned to come to you. I, were they in Rome going? Geez, he goes everywhere else, but he doesn't want. To, we would really like to see the Apostle Paul and, and hear what he has to say. You know. Paul's just saying, I don't, I don't want you to be unaware that I planned to come to you, but I was hindered. And sometimes, we've seen this before, it's a timing. The Lord wants you to go. He puts it in your heart to go somewhere, but there's hindrances, there's roadblocks. You need to pray through them, see if they, he removes the roadblocks, or it's a timing. There'll be a right time. See, there was a timing for Paul to get to Rome. He was, until that time, he was hindered. But his heart is that he might bear fruit there in Rome as he has borne fruit everywhere else that he has gone. He sees that, being fruitful. Just reminds me of Jesus, John 15, you know. You're going to bear fruit, much fruit, more fruit. You're going to be very fruitful. And that is in the kingdom things. And Paul just loved to bear fruit. And so that's what he was doing here. That's what he says to these Romans in this first chapter. It goes on, verse 14 and 15 and 16. I am a debtor both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and to unwise. I'm a debtor to both Greeks, Greeks and barbarians. Barbarians, uh, well, what that meant back then was it's just some, somebody, barbarian is someone who did not speak Greek. That's what they called people that didn't speak Greek, barbarians. They might speak Roman, Jewish, Hebrew, you know, things, other languages. And, and 
that's what they were called. But I am, I am a debtor both to Greeks and to barbarians. I owe them. I owe them. I need to, to share with them. Verse 15, so as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. I'm ready to preach. I'm a debtor to you guys because I want to, I need to show you the gospel, the way to eternal life. I, I have this in my heart and I want to share it with you and I am ready to preach. Are we ready to preach the gospel anywhere we go? Man, it's the only thing. You know, it just reminds me, Matthew 24, you know, and Jesus talking about the great tribulation, things like this, all kinds of things happening, earthquakes, wars, famines, pestilences, all kinds of things. But he says, and the, the word of God, the gospel must be preached across the entire world, and then the end will come. So we're always looking for all these other things to happen, but really, it's the preaching of the gospel. So are we ready to preach the gospel as Paul is just excited about the opportunity to preach the gospel? So he's writing this letter and he's saying, I'm ready, ready to get there, I'm ready to preach. And verse 16, you should know this. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. This was part of his whole lifestyle. First of all, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Oh man, how many people could we look back to and see that they were not ashamed of the gospel, even to the point of death. You know, they were threatened with all kinds of threats you need to stop preaching the gospel. They're not ashamed. They're not ashamed of Jesus, not ashamed at all of the gospel, of the good news of Jesus Christ. And, and Paul says, I'm not ashamed of it. it. Why? Because it's the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes. It has the power to change the direction of your life. It has the power to give you eternal life and save you from destruction. And all you have to do is believe. It's a powerful, powerful gospel. And that's why he's not ashamed of it. And he says here in this verse, to the Jew first and also for the Greek. That was not an order of like, okay, the Jews come first and then the Greeks, but that was just what he did first, he went to the Jewish synagogues whenever he visited a city. He went to the synagogue first to be able to share the gospel there with, with his brothers, Jewish brothers, but there was gonna be also Greeks there. And, and so he wanted to share to everyone. That's it, to the Jew first and also for the Greek. That's the entire world, okay? That's everybody. It just kind of, I'm going to read to you from Acts 13, and I'm only going to read verses 46 through 52, but this was in his first missionary journey to Antioch, and you know, at this point in time, he had shared with the Jewish people, they had become jealous and envious when the crowds began to grow. At first, they wanted to hear, but then they became jealous when, uh, like, uh, you know, the crowds came and Gentiles were begging to hear the gospel, to hear the word of God, begging. Oh man, I pray that, and that's what I pray for, the people where I live would be begging to hear the word of God. It just seems like we're in a, a time of hard soils and nobody really wants to hear they're too distracted with everything else in this world. Uh, I wish they were begging. Well, at any rate, verse 46 says, Then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God sp spoke, spoke, be spoken to you first. That's to the Jews. But since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. 
For so the Lord has commanded us, I have set you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be for salvation to the ends of the earth. How far is that supposed to go? To the end of the earth. I've set you as a light. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works. Glorify your Father who is in heaven. Paul says he's, the Lord has commanded us to go out with the gospel. We, we were supposed to go out to the Jews and to the Gentiles. We're turning to the Gentiles. Now, it says in verse 48, Now when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. There it is right there. That's God's heart. He wants all the world to turn towards him in belief. And uh, man, this is the kind of revival that we, we pray for. Oh man, when people start to hear, they become glad and they glorify the word of the Lord. And in verse 49, it goes on, and the word of the Lord was being spread throughout all the region. It's like lighting a fire. But the Jews stirred up the devout and prominent women and the chief men of the city, raised up persecution against Paul and Barnabas, expelled them from their region. <laughs> Getting rid of these troublemakers. And that's what happens. There's always a, 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 something that happens. You know, Jesus, Paul goes and Barnabas goes and they share the gospel. There are some who receive it, hear, hear believe, receive it. Some who think about it and say, oh, well, and walk away. And then there are some who just oppress you. And, and we live in a world that wants to, <clears throat> well, shut the gospel up and shut up people. That's why we need to not be ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And that's what it says here, verse 51, they shook off the dust from their feet against them and came to Iconium. <clears throat> and the disciples were filled with joy and the Holy Spirit. You see, I had to put those verses in there because there's oppression, things like that. We even, I just read, or I just heard of a instance today that the Supreme Court is taking up the uh, case of a football coach it's come all the way to the Supreme Court that uh, his, his, his football team, his high school football uh, team, he would, at the end of every game, sit, kneel down on the 50-yard line and pray. He didn't tell anybody else they had to, but they might come voluntarily. Well, the school system fired him, and so it's gone all the way to the Supreme Court. Uh, he's not ashamed of the gospel. He would not compromise would not compromise at all. And we ought not to compromise. If we do start to compromise and give in, well, then they win and they can shut us up. But if we go on, no matter what, you shake the dust off your feet and the, the disciples, that, that, that football coach, no matter what, he's filled with joy. doesn't matter if he loses the case or not. He stood up for the Lord and for his convictions. And for that, I believe he's filled with joy in the Holy Spirit. Verse 17 of Romans chapter 1 is where we're going to finish today. And uh, <clears throat> it's quite a verse, really. This is the verse that Martin Luther <clears throat> got saved with. As he read Romans, he was a, a Catholic priest and uh, was just kind of wondering about all these indulgences and rules and things like that. And he read <clears throat> Romans chapter 1, verse 17, For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. See, there it is. By faith you are saved. It's by faith. It's not by works. It's not by anything that we can do. And probably if you're watching this, you, you know this already, and I'm just reminding of you that. But this is, this, this is just part of the doctrine that is in Romans. This is such a key thing. The just shall live by faith. Romans chapter 10, verse 9 through 13 
I'm going to read 9 and 10 right now. Paul would say, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So how are you saved? The just shall live by faith. Those who live by faith will be justified in the eyes of the Lord. You'll be able to stand before him, not because of what you've done, good or bad. And we don't want to come to him. I, I don't, don't say, oh, I'm going to wait. And, yeah, I'm, going to, I'm a pretty good person, so I think I can stand before God and, and things are going to weigh out just right. No, it's not going to weigh out right. It's by faith in Jesus Christ that he went to a cross and died for your sins. But you confess with your mouth. You have to do it with your mouth, but you have to believe in your heart. You, you can say things, all, all kinds of things with your mouth, but if it doesn't come from your heart, then it's meaningless. And what is it that you m must believe in your heart? God raised him from the dead. Not just the cross, not just that he paid for your sins, but that he rose from the dead. That is the good news. That's the good news right there. Good news is that he's not in the tomb. The stone was rolled away. He ascended to the Father, and he's coming back. He lives today. Verse 10 says, For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Again, with the heart one believes, and that becomes your righteousness. And with your mouth you confess, your confession is made unto salvation. Verse 11 through 13, for the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. So the scripture says, and not just me or a bunch of preachers or Paul, but the scripture itself says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. There is no distinction between Jew and Greek. Oh, man, we're uh, mankind, humans, we just break things up into groups. And, and this group over here and that group over here becomes a racial thing, all kinds of things. There's no distinction between Jew and Greek or any race at all. God loves all the little children. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. Anyone who calls upon him. Verse 13, for whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved whoever's it's the whoever's whosoever believes in him and so it's not jew it's not just greeks not just americans it's the whole world the whole family of mankind man it's going to be so interesting when we get together in heaven with so many different people so many varieties oh and we're all going to share the same lord and the same love for the lord ephesians 2 8 9 i'm going to end with these two verses here that bring home this point about faith we're just about justified by faith ephesians 2 8 and 9 say for by grace you have been saved through faith that not of yourselves it is the gift of god not of works, lest anyone should boast. By grace you have been saved. Grace. He is rich in grace and mercy. It's not of yourself. You can't do anything. It is a gift. Do you work for a gift? You work for pay, maybe, or for a reward you may work for, but you don't work for a gift. A gift is given to you, and this is a gift that comes from God. It's not of your works. And if it was of your works, you'd be able to boast and brag about it. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. And finally, Titus chapter 3. I really want to get to verse 5, but I cannot skip over verse 4 because I just love it. <clears throat> when the kindness and the love of God, our Savior toward man, appeared. Did you catch that? 
<laughs> it's when the kindness and the love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared. My name, Dan, fits in there perfectly. I can just change one letter. But when the kindness and the love of God, our Savior, toward Dan appeared, <laughs> that means something to me. I think you can put your name in there. God is kind. He's not filled with wrath. He's not going to just look into smoke you or anything like that. No, it's the kindness and the love of God. It's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. That's what I see here. But verse 5, not by works of righteousness, which we have done. But according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. When you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and in his mercy that he has given to us freely, <laughs> he washes us, he cleanses us, he renews us, he puts his Holy Spirit into us. And we are truly born again. And we are sealed with that Holy Spirit for all eternity and therefore we have a great inheritance an inheritance is not earned you do not earn an inheritance you are just born into the family and given an inheritance and that's what this book is about paul brings us through to that point and uh, I encourage you to read ahead as we finish this chapter. I don't know how far we're going to get uh, next week, but hey, uh, take it as, a, as it comes and just read on. God bless you and have a great, great day.